My name is Gregory Morrissey, and I am the senior pastor of the Plymouth Church in Framingham, an open and affirming congregation in the United Church of Christ. Whoever you are, whenever you watch this video, whatever your questions or confessions, however you come to this struggle of faith, you have a place here, a seat at Christ's table, and I'm glad you're with us. The first book we are reading this summer is Reading the Bible Again for the First Time by Marcus Borg, taking the Bible seriously, but not literally. I chose this, chose this book for a few reasons. I think the first is that I love the Bible. The richness and complexity and wisdom grip my heart, and they give me such joy and hope. And Right now, the Bible is used in some pretty terrible ways and ignorant ways. I, I don't say that in judgment. I mean that as a very specific statement of fact. There is information and knowledge that is missing. And this book can help decode some of that mystery and remystify some of the things we think we know. I'm really excited uh, about our church right now and some of the questions we're asking and some of the places we're going. I'm hopeful for what we can accomplish together as followers of Jesus. I know the challenges we face today are strikingly familiar to what the early church faced. And so the questions they wrestled with and how they wrestled with them can be, for us, a light onto our path. Now, full disclosure, this book was written in 2000, so that's a while ago. Uh, it was written before the internet or smartphones, uh, so there are going to be some parts of this book that show its age. But the scholarship that Marcus Borg describes isn't new. It's been known for half a century and longer and has been taught in seminaries and in divinity schools for a while now. It's what I learned and it's still what's taught today. Borg identifies an important fault line between a literal, factual way of reading the Bible and a historical, metaphorical way. And what's at stake in these two different readings of Scripture are questions about its origin, its authority, and its interpretation. I think it's fair to say most of the church globally approaches Scripture with a literal, factual bias. The Bible comes directly from God and is therefore the word of God, and so its authority is absolute and cannot be questioned, which leads directly into a literal read of the text. You may have encountered words like infallible or inerrant, incapable of making mistakes, and incapable of being wrong. Be pretty nice to be one of those, right? The Bible, it is suggested, should be read like you would an encyclopedia, or a textbook, or a manual. Borg is advocating for something else, for the historical metaphorical approach. Borg makes an important point. Fundamentalism is a reaction to modern culture. Fundamentalism is new. As the methodology of science gained traction in the West, there was an equal and opposite movement in favor of what I'll call blindered faith. The scientific method demands that we create a hypothesis and then test that hypothesis with the aim to disprove it. And in the face of that kind of skepticism, the curiosity and open wondering, fundamentalism argues for submission, for compliance. You know, even those words today now have a negative resonance, don't they? But fundamentalism wasn't evil in its original intent. It is an attempt, well-meaning, to preserve reverence and awe against the fear that the majesty of God would be lost if we pursued scientific discovery. But curiosity isn't the death of awe. At least in my experience, inquiry doesn't erode my wonder or gratitude in the face of God's power. Rather, it can deepen it. The Bible is a human document, 
In this chapter, Borg makes a pretty bold claim. He writes on page 27. Thus, the lens I am advocating does not see the Bible as a whole as divine in origin, or some parts as divine and some as human. It is all a human product, though generated in response to God. As such, it contains ancient Israel's perceptions and misperceptions of what life with God involves, just as it contains the early Christian movements perceptions, and misperceptions. I don't know who first said this, but I have made it my own over the years. The Bible is the collective story of the people of God as they try to figure out what it means to be the people of God. For me, this is really important. If for no other reason than to accept the Bible as a human work requires me then to show up in a different way. I cannot passively then receive scripture. I must participate in the conversation. I must come with questions and, and curiosity, with my openness, but also with my mind alert. In my life, it is precisely, precisely this active conversation with scripture that has been both annoying and amazing. So yeah, I, I can understand why some people might prefer that literal, factual approach. It requires a whole lot less effort. If the Bible is human, then what does that do for our understanding of its authority and its place in our lives? And, and what impact does that have on the work of interpreting Scripture into our daily lives, both individually as well as, as a community of faith? The historical metaphorical approach is an umbrella of sorts, meant to encompass two questions. The historical question, what did this text mean in the ancient historical setting in which it was written? The metaphorical, what does this story mean as a story, independent of its historical factuality? I have found it really useful in my faith journey to remember that Jesus was a human person in a particular context. He had a favorite meal. He had a best friend. When he didn't sleep, he probably got grouchy. And on the Sabbath, he went to temple. Now, since I'm not Jewish, nor a citizen of ancient Israel under occupation in Rome, there are going to be some things that I miss. Similarly, I find it useful to remember that just as I now describe my encounters with God through metaphor and example, so did the authors of Scripture. When I say God called me into ministry, there was no phone involved. In 2,000 years, I, I wonder, will someone think that my phone rang and I answered it? Or, or will they understand that it rang, but I didn't recognize the number, so obviously I let it go to voicemail. There is a lot in this chapter about the value of both the historical and metaphorical lenses, and the limitations of both. In the very last section, Borg identifies three stages. They can sometimes map onto our human developmental stages, though not always. In our early childhood, we often defer to the authority figures in our lives, parents, teachers, maybe even pastors. When I couldn't feed myself or tie my own shoes, I pretty much lived in the world as my parents presented it to me. Borg calls this our pre-critical naivete. How many of us grew up with the Noah story and thought there really was an ark with two elephants and two lions and two giraffes walking up a plank to get inside? Next, in, in adolescence, and I wonder maybe if now even earlier with the advent of the internet and the information age, we begin to develop critical thinking. We ask questions. Not just questions to understand how things work, those are important, but questions to unpack how we make sense of the world and our place in it. More than one youth in our congregation has, has grown up in the church, made their way through Sunday school, and they hit this stage. And they confess to me that they stopped believing in God because really an ark 
You really think two of every species in the world fit onto a boat and then God flooded the whole earth? Actually, it's about this time that I lost my own faith. In part because I didn't know what my questions were and because I didn't know they were valid and welcome. At some point, we enter what Borg calls the post-critical naivete. And this is the ability to set aside what we know about truth and fact and allow the conversation to continue. We let truth and fact maybe coincide and maybe not. Borg quotes a Native American storyteller who begins a creation story by saying, I don't know if it happened this way or not, but I know this story is true. All right, I hope that was somewhat helpful or at least not confusing. I hope that encourages you to dive into this section one and think about your own place in this conversation, your own approach to scripture. Next week, I will try to pick out some of the insights from part two, the Hebrew Bible. And as a reminder, next month, we will be reading Roger Shin's Confessing Our Faith, an interpretation of the statement of faith of the United Church of Christ. It's a shorter book uh, in August that details how our United Church of Christ statement of faith came into being and what each section suggests about God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and our responsibilities as people of the church. May God bless you and keep you until we meet again. Mm -hmm.